All right, Amen. One announcement that I did forget to make is that September 5th, uh, we'll be having Kids Day. And so the details for that will be uh, on the bulletin for this coming Sunday. So with that out of the way now, let's go, get, uh, go ahead and get into this here. You're there in Ephesians chapter number five. Look down at verse number 22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. The title of the sermon this evening is Gender Hierarchy. Gender Hierarchy. Um, this is part of our series um, called New Evangelical Abuse. Stopping New Evangelical Abuse. Now, the word hierarchy, what does that mean? Well, the definition dictionary, um, the definition in the dictionary says this, a system or organization in which people or groups are ranked one above the other according to status or authority. Now this, especially these two verses that I just read for you today, they are under extreme attack and have been for a very, very long time. And what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna, lure, we're gonna learn how new evangelicals actually abuse women in their churches, not just in the here and now, but throughout all eternity. The consequences that they are having on their women will last for eternity if they do not get out of those churches. I'm gonna prove that beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now, what inspired this sermon was I heard an interview, or I watched about 10 minutes of this interview, and it was this soy boy, you know, wearing a pink shirt, and he's interviewing this lady, and her name is Beth Allison Barr. She's an author, she's a, a medieval scholar, and she's a pastor's wife, believe it or not. And she doesn't agree that these verses here actually mean what they say that they mean. Now, for those of us who are saved or just straight up honest, you can see that there's an order here in the home. Who's the head in the home? Is it the wife or is it the husband? It's the husband. There's no debating that, but yet they want to debate this, right? And so I'm watching this interview and this soy boy, he's like, you know, when I used to be in the independent fundamental Baptist church, you know, they would always start in verse 22, you know, but one day I read verse number 21 and it changed my life. And then she's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, she's getting all fired up and getting all excited. She's like, yeah, they never want to talk about verse 21. Well, guess what we're going to do? Oh, we're going to talk about verse 21. We're going to talk big time about verse number 21. Now her thing in what she likes to keep bringing Bringing up is what uh, what is called complementarianism. Okay, we'll just refer to it as Ephesians chapter number five. Okay, <laughs> the order in which God has established uh, the local church, the family, the world, so on and so forth. But just so you know where I'm coming from, let me just read for you the definition of complementarianism. So Wikipedia, not the all uh, the, the greatest source of truth, but it is the definition that they are using. So complementarianism is this: it's a theological view. In Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that men and women have different but complementary roles and responsibilities in marriage, family, life, and religious leadership. The word complementary and its congregates are currently used to denote this view. Some Christians interpret the Bible as prescribing complementarianism and therefore adhere to gender-specific roles that preclude women from specific functions of ministry within the community. Okay, we're gonna talk about that. So basically what they're saying is they're like, well, some Christians actually don't let women become pastors and they don't let them get up and teach the Bible. And again, what does the Bible say? Because in this church, the Bible is the final authority. Whatever it says is what we go with. Okay, that everybody knows that. And then it goes on to say this, the women may have um, been precluded from certain roles and ministries. They are held to be equal in moral value and equal status. Uh, the phrase used to describe this is ontologically equal or whatever. It don't matter what they say, right? Obviously, you know, men, women that are saved the same way. God, you know, doesn't look on a woman and say, oh, you're inferior to this man. I've got nothing for you. You should just, you know, be quiet, never say anything to anybody, blah, blah, blah. No, they want to make it sound like that's what we teach, but that's not what we teach at all. In fact, if you pay attention and you listen to what I have to tell you, it is actually the exact opposite, especially the women in our types of churches, right? Our women do more preaching, do more teaching than their women do. But the difference is they do it according to the word of God and they do it as prescribed in the Bible. Okay. So I, I cut and pasted a little bit of an article that she wrote uh, regarding this subject. And this kind of explains a little bit of her history. And so she starts this article um, off like this, it says this for years, 
Now this is uh, the woman Beth Barr, she's speaking here. For years I attended complementarian churches. For years I stayed silent in those churches, outwardly supporting the complementarian structures while inwardly moving away from complementarian teachings, okay? So the story is they used to be part of the Southern Baptist Church. Her husband was a pastor on staff. And, you know, and, and back in the day where she was going through this, they didn't allow women preachers. And so that's starting to upset her. That's starting to offend her. And so she's saying basically, hey, I realized I had an awakening. I had the fog lift away from my eyes that this is wrong. And, and they're all equal in church and family. And again, we'll come back to that. The article goes on to say this. When we finally decided that enough was enough. In our final complementarian church, my husband, a pastor on staff, tried to address the gender hierarchy and authoritarian structure with the elders. He was promptly fired. Sounds like a good church to me. <laughs> you know? Thankfully, I have gained some perspective since that happened. I have realized that by staying silent for so long, I had become complicit in a system that used the name of Jesus to oppress and harm women. So this is her mentality here. She's got a book. She's, you know, does speaking engagements and she's not alone. This isn't some little small obscure thing. This is really taking place in America and throughout the world in churches here, right? They're basically saying, hey, God, what you wrote is wrong. Think about that. What this woman is doing here is shaking her fist at the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, you are wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. And when you go on to really study what she says, she keeps bringing up this, well, I'm not a Bible teacher. I'm not a Bible scholar, but you know, I am a medieval scholar. And you know, she keeps quoting what some saint so-and-so said in the 13th century about a certain passage. Look, that's not what we base our Christianity off of. It's the Bible, which God is more than capable of preserving for us today in an understandable language. Now, um, as I was reading this article, I came across this quote. So she's talking, she goes on and starts talking about this woman named Beth Moore. Who's ever heard of Beth Moore? Beth Moore is from, I looked her up. She's a very popular author, uh, an American evangelist and Bible teacher. Okay, she's got books, she does speaking engagements, so on and so forth. And she's like, I was really inspired one day by Beth Moore's tweet. And Beth Moore basically said something like this, um, you know, the, the, once I realized that the complementarian ways of churches is wrong, I felt like a fog was just lifted off of my eyes and then now I can just clearly see. You know what that sounds like to me? When Eve ate <laughs> the fruit of the tree in the garden. Right? And it was like scales, like just, just her eyes were opened and now all of a sudden she knew good and evil. Well, you see, there's a doctrine in the Bible that says when you willingly want to change the word of God that is written, guess what? There's going to be a so-called fog and some opening of the eyes, but that's not a good thing. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> and that's a whole nother subject in and of itself. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that is satanic. But this is the teaching today. They accuse us of not understanding Ephesians chapter number five. They accuse us of abusing women because of the way that we are, because we teach that the man is the head of the house and that only men can be preachers. What does the Bible say? Let's take a look. Ephesians chapter number five. Look at verse 22 again. It says this, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Let me just stop right there for a second here, okay? Because sometimes people get this twisted up as well. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, okay? That, guess what that means, guys? We don't go bossing other people's wives around, okay? We had somebody in this church that used to do that right? <laughs> and that didn't end too well. Joanna was like, what? But anyways, <laughs> I should have talked to you before I mentioned that, but um, that is a bad thing. But some people just get it in their heads. They could just tell any woman in the church what to do, how to do it. That is not what we're saying. We don't teach that at all. The wife is only subject to her own husband. You tell my wife what to do. She's going to tell you what to do. She's going to tell you the facts. Yeah. I would expect that from any lady in here. If some guy's telling you what to do. No, you turn it right back around on them and say, no, you just you need to be quiet. You need to stop talking to me like that. Amen. Verse number 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now look, do we need to go back to some obscure language to figure out what that means? I mean, is anybody in here confused what that means? Good. Let's move on. Even as Christ is the head of the church. Well, how do we implement that? What does that look like? How is Christ the head of the church? Does he come down and audibly speak to me before each service? They preach this, say this. No, the Bible 
the word of God, the living words that are in this book. This is what we base all facts, all truth, how we run the services on through the Bible, the word of God. It says, even as Christ is the head of the church. So let's turn this around for a second and say, no, actually what that really means is the pastor's the head of the church and Christ needs to come to him or they're equally running this ship. Huh? Oh, that's blasphemy, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I would be scared to death to say something like that. However, what you need to understand and what I preach all the time, most churches say that without saying it. Anytime a pastor gets up and says, hey, in the original languages, what it used to say back in the day, anytime they say that, that's what they're doing. Christ is no longer the head of that church. It's that man. Because now you have to go to him to get your truth. Prove me wrong. I dare somebody in here to prove me wrong. You can't do it. I will smoke you six ways from Sunday. Look at the rest of this verse. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So are you the savior of the body? Are we the saviors of the body or is it Christ? Very simple to understand who is in charge of the church. So who is in charge of the household? The wife or the husband? Oh, it's the husband. Not hard to understand, but apparently it's hard for some people to understand. In fact, apparently it's hard for a lot of people to understand. And you say, you know what? You're getting pretty upset. You're getting pretty fired up. Yeah, because I hate falsehood. Amen. I don't like it. It's ruining this country. And you know what? It's not going to ruin this church. Amen. We're going to learn how to defend this passage the way it is written, because we stand for the truth in this church here. So they, they, you know, they, they read this verse from a, a, on that podcast from like this false Bible version, right? And then they're like, Oh, but verse 21, it just puts them all to bed and it puts them all to shame. So if you would, let's look at verse number 21. It says this, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then when you read the comments, people are like, see, husband and wife are exactly equal. You know, that, you know, all these modern Bible versions, they just have this, you know, arranged this way because there's an agenda and blah, blah, blah. Look, that is blasphemy to say that. Amen. That is not Okay. And I'm going to prove to you that that is not what this verse is talking about here. But let me disclaim this before I go on any further. That doesn't mean that the husband is supposed to be this totalitarian, just Hitler style dictator. Okay. That is not what we're talking about at all. If you have any questions about this, we will address it. I've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Just keep listening here. So now in order to get the context of verse 21, we're actually going to go back to chapter number four. But before we do that, let's just go back to the beginning of this chapter here and see what we learn. Look at verse number one. Ephesians chapter five, look at verse number one, because the question for the sermon is what does verse 21 mean? Does verse 21 trump 22, 23? Does it change the meaning or what? What's going on here? Okay. Look at verse number one. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Interesting. Why does it say that? Be ye therefore. You see those three words there? Be ye therefore. Therefore, that's how the chapter starts off. So in order to really understand what that means, you need to go back to the chapter prior to this, which is chapter number four, which I would like you to do right now. Turn to Ephesians chapter number four. So he says, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. What in the world does that mean? What does therefore mean? Meaning for this reason. Okay, so we need to find out as God's people, what is this reason here? Because if you don't understand that reason, you cannot understand verse 21, nor can you understand the rest of the book. So Ephesians chapter four here, look at verse number one. Paul says this, I therefore as, I'm sorry, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Look at verse two, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Verse four, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. What is this talking about here? He's, what he's doing here is he's starting off this chapter saying, hey, I beseech you. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you to understand certain things regarding the body of Christ, regarding the mindset of a local New Testament church. That is what he is talking about here. So 
To further prove that, jump down, if you would, to verse number 11. We've talked about this recently where uh, Paul tells the Ephesians, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? Verse number 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And of course, the, the apostles, the prophets, that's your New Testament. That's your Old Testament, okay? That is what we trust on. Why do we have these things? For the perfecting of the saints so that we can learn through the word of God how to operate in the Christian life, how to run a church, how to get people saved, how to disciple people, how to stand up for truth. So, and then of course in verse 13, he says, till all or till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So again, are we talking about marriage here? No. No. What are we talking about? We're talking about operating in the body of Christ as a local New Testament church. So we're going to skip some verses for the sake of time, but look at verse number 17. It says this, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. This is the context when you get to Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1, all the way through verse number 20, really through the whole chapter, okay? Read that again, because this is very important here. When someone throws up to you, hey, Ephesians 5, 21, doesn't mean what you think it means. You need to make sure you understand what's talking about, what, what this uh, chapter is talking about here. This I say, therefore. So again, there's that word, therefore. So he's saying this verse here for a reason, for the reasons we already, already went over, because he's trying to teach us how to operate in the body of Christ. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth, meaning from here on out, Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Well, you know what? All it takes is for you to go to work, go to school, just go out into the world. And what do you see when it comes to marriage? You see what Pastor Anderson calls a two-headed monster. You see mom and dad trying to battle for power and control in the home. And I'm going to show you why that is impossible to work today. But is that not true? And why do they do those things? Partly because that's just the way the world is. That's how the world works. They don't have the wisdom of God. They don't know any better. They do these things and it winds up hurting their marriages. But what are we learning from this verse here? Hey, we don't want to walk like they do. We don't want to be like they are. Look at verse number 18. Having the understanding darkened. Now don't miss this. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now keep your place there and hold that thought because we're going to come back to it, but we're going to go to a few other passages. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 14. So new evangelical churches um, like Beth's, you know, to be honest, what they do is they actually alienate people, especially women from the life of God. Right. They do that 100%. And, um, you know, I was reading her biography on a website and she's like, now my pastor, you know, is, or now my husband's the pastor of a Baptist church that actually respects women and puts women in ministry and lets them pastor. And that's the way that God wants it to be. Really? Really? Well, let's see what the Bible says. First Corinthians chapter 14, look at verse number 34. Is there a hierarchy in the local New Testament church? What does the Bible say? First Corinthians chapter number 14, look at verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Let's stop right there. I don't care what language you go back to. It says the same exact thing. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. And before you email and call and text and say, what about women singing? Look, that's not what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about is the actual preaching service that a church is administering. You have to read the whole chapter. We don't have time for that. But Paul is saying, hey, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. And what they keep saying is, well, no, Paul wrote that because of Roman law. Chapter and verse, please. Chapter and verse, please. Chapter and verse, please. I need it right now. I need it. Oh, you know what's going to happen? They're not going to provide it because they don't have it. That is a cop-out. That is a weak excuse. That is a lie. That is an attack 
on the Bible. Because if you know the Bible, if you've read your Bible, if you've studied it, what was the expectation here of the Corinthian church? It was to send this letter out to all the other churches. They were all supposed to read all the letters, all the epistles, all the teachings, all the doctrines from this church and from the other churches. We know that. So this obviously applies to all churches throughout the ages. Look at verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Don't miss this, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. What are you going to say about that, soy boy? <laughs> Beth Barr? And I look, you, you're mean, you're hurtful. I'm angry. Yeah. If you're not angry about this, there's something wrong with you. Right. Look, whose side are you on? Yeah. Are you on the Lord's side or are you on the world's side? You know, pick your side and stick with it. This is the Bible. Well, that goes into the face of what's being taught today in schools and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, because there's somebody coming on the scene here, which seems to be pretty soon, who would love nothing more than to turn the whole world upside down so that they would mindlessly serve him and worship him. And that's called the Antichrist. And if they will learn anything at home, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. There's no debating this. This is not optional here. Okay. And again, the build this, look, what you're sitting in right now is a building right now. Church is in session after church, women are allowed to speak, whatever, you know, and if they want to sing or whatever, we have a special choir or whatever. No problem. Don't be stupid. There's no problem with that at all. And you say, well, what if my husband doesn't come to church? What if I don't have a husband? Then fine. Ask your question after church and I'll answer it for you. I'll take the hit. Okay. How about that? I'll take the hit. Is that okay? <laughs> Give me a break. Verse 36, just in case you didn't understand the prior two verses, look what he says. What? Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? And that's the question that we need to have burned into our hearts and into our minds. Because when people want to argue this, it's like, what? Came the word of God only unto you? This is crystal clear. You Look, this is the King James Bible here. And you know what? I bet if you look up all these other versions, it probably says something similar. Maybe not all of them, but at least some of them, okay? And I'm not endorsing them. I'm just simply stating a fact. Turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. So, is there a gender hierarchy in the local New Testament church? Well, apparently when it comes to teaching the Word of God and preaching and becoming a pastor, yes. Women are not allowed to teach the Bible in the church. They are not allowed to pastor. And that doesn't mean it's because they're inferior. Look, I bet there's tons of women that could preach better sermons than anybody. It doesn't make it right, though. 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 11. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. Verse number 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. You know, and during this interview that I was watching, they're like, it just blows my mind. It just baffles me. It blows me away. It baffles me. It blows me away. And they just kept saying stuff like that. You know, that people don't understand what we're talking about. Actually, it baffles me <laughs> that you can't understand what is simply written down in this book. Yeah. Go to chapter number three, and I'll show you a picture. What does this look like here? Paul is going to get very descriptive for us. You say, I don't, I don't agree with you. I think it's fine that Joyce Meyer is a pastor. I think it's fine that Beth Moore gets up and she's an evangelist and teaches the Bible. I think you're misogynistic. I think you're a pig. I don't care what you think. If I did, we'd have 10,000 people here today. 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 1. This is a true saying. Now, does anybody want to debate that? <laughs> this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. We'll stop right there. What if a woman desires the, offer, uh, the office of a bishop? Hey, does anybody in here have the Bible verses or the passage that gives her qualifications. I'll wait. Boy, it sure is quiet in here. Look at verse number two. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. What? The husband of one wife. So if the bishop is the wife of one husband, what do we have? We have a problem. <laughs> we have something unbiblical. There is an issue with that. 
because what is he saying? If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Jump down to verse number four. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Verse number five. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So again, this blows Catholicism right out of the water, doesn't it? Because what does a Catholic church teach? Oh, well, you know, our bishops and priests, they cannot, we forbid them to be married. You know, the Bible talks about that. Yeah. Paul talked about that. That is satanic. Verse number six, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, verse seven, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Now, hey, there's your complementarianism right out the window. And this is what, look, this is why I'm so angry about this. This is why we need to push hard for the rest of our lives to just tell these people like Beth Allison Barr, Beth Moore, Joyce Meyer, any one of them, people that don't agree, hey, join the Catholic Church. Yeah. Don't say that you're a Christian. Don't, especially don't be going around saying, oh, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Hey, brother, hey, sister, no. No, because you don't believe the Bible. There's no debating this at all. But yet we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that want to debate this, even in the Treasure Valley. How sick, how perverted can you be? How blasphemous can you get? Go to Acts chapter number 21. Acts chapter number 21. So you say, okay, great, I get it, I understand. But what does that mean about women? They just could never do anything for Christ, huh? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Because in case you haven't figured out, at Shield of Faith Baptist Church, we have a soul winning program. And it's not just men. Soul winning is a time where we go out into the community and we knock on people's doors and we try to find people who are interested in hearing the good news of Jesus Christ and we preach in the gospel. And guess what? Our women do that. And you know what? Our women, when they get people saved, you know what they do? Sometimes they teach them doctrine. Amen. And they get them straightened out on a lot of different things. And you know what? That is a glorious thing. That is a biblical thing. Amen. Is that what Beth Allison Barr is doing? Is that what that soy boy, I wish I knew what his name was. Is that what he's doing? No. That's not what they're doing. So what are they doing? They are the ones abusing women because they are robbing women of an opportunity to get eternal rewards. Right. Acts chapter 21, look at verse number 8. It says this. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. You guys remember Philip? The guy who when God said, hey, there's an Ethiopian guy that's reading Isaiah. You need to go talk to him. You need to go over there. What did he do? He ran to that man and got him saved. Right? He's an evangelist. He preaches the word of God. Look at this. Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, right? One of the seven, the deacons, and abode with him. Verse number nine, look what it says. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Oh, wait a second. You know what's funny? I never hear them bring this up either. They just want to bring up how the Greek and the Hebrew and the ancient language that nobody speaks today said something different. But what I'm seeing here is that a a man who was an evangelist named Philip had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. What does that mean? It means to foretell the word of God. You see, what does foretell mean? It means to make public. It's what I'm doing right now. I'm taking what is written in this book and I'm making it public. I'm publishing it. That's what you do when you go out and you preach the gospel. You take what's written here, the good news, the doctrines, everything, and you go out and you publish it. You make it known. You are prophesying. You are foretelling. We've got a church here full of women. We've got more women preachers here than they all have put together. And that's a glorious thing. I mean, doesn't it make sense that the evangelist Philip would actually teach his daughters how to give the gospel, right? Because think about this. It says they're virgins, obviously implying that someday they're going to get married and hopefully marry somebody else, a man who can do the same thing. And maybe they could start churches and the wife can be a blessing and an extreme help and they could compliment one another to get the work of God done that God wants. In fact, you see an example of that if you go back to Acts chapter number 18. Fact, uh, Acts chapter number 18, look at verse number 26. 
And you'll see an example of what I'm talking about here. Acts chapter 18, look at verse 26. It says this, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. This is talking about Apollos. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Look at that. A husband and wife team preaching the word of God more perfectly to Apollos. What impact did that have on the local New Testament churches of that area? Immense. Apollos was a mighty man in God's word. I mean, Apollos was highly respected. He did a lot of work for God. But guess who it was that straightened him out? It wasn't just the man. Oh, that's the woman. No, it was that combination. So don't sit here and accuse us of abusing women because our women don't get up here and preach the Bible during men's preaching night. You don't preach the Bible anytime, anywhere, ever. In fact, all they do is spend time undermining and undercutting what the Bible says, which is blasphemy. And you know, we need to make sure that this doctrine gets battered over and over and over again to these people because they're not going to stop. The reason why they're as famous and as popular as they are is because no one's got the guts to confront them. But we do. Amen. Go back to Ephesians chapter number four. So all of that, all of the last, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes I've been rambling is just to explain Ephesians 4, 17, which is the verse that's going to set us up to get to Ephesians chapter number five, verse 21. Okay. So Beth Barr and all the Christian commies, you know what, what they do is what you read here in Ephesians chapter four, verse 17, where he says this, this, I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. That is them. Look at this verse 18, having the understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God through ignorance. That is what these churches do. And you say, oh, you're starting a cult? No, I'm preaching the Bible. I wish there was hundreds and thousands of churches in Boise alone that was agreeing with me and teaching what the Bible says. But what is Paul saying to the Ephesians here? Hey, there are a group of people out there that alienate, meaning separate people so that they cannot serve God. That is what these people are doing. These Christian commies, that is exactly what they are doing. That's what Beth Barr is doing. That's what her Soy Boy podcast is doing. That's what her book does. Look at verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. With greed. Look, what I'm telling you today is free. It might cost you a little bit of your eardrums. It might cause you a little bit of that lot in your stomach. Like, oh, how far is it going to go with this? Oh, calm down. But that's okay. Right? That's free. That's good for you. That stress you feel sometimes in this church, that is what matures you and makes you into a better person. Look at verse number 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. What does that tell us? When somebody wants to alienate somebody from serving God the way that these Christian commies do, guess what? They have not learned Christ. Verse number 21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Okay. What does that verse mean? That is backing up verse number 17. Please understand this. We're going to get moving here. Verse 23 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Are we talking about marriage here? No, we're talking about operating in the body of Christ, about truth, about doctrine, about serving God. Jump down, if you would, to verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. We use that verse all the time to prove that once you're saved, you are always saved. You can never lose your salvation. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Right? What are we talking about here? Operating in the body of Christ with one another, not just husband and wife. Verse 32. And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. What are we talking about? Husband and wife or just the body of Christ? Right, the body of Christ. Now, obviously, husband and wife need to respect each other and stuff. We're going to talk about it here in a second. But now look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. First three words, be ye therefore. So for that reason, for the reason we just spent covering, right? Verse 17, all the way to 32. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Now jump down to verse number eight. For ye were sometimes in darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
Well, what does that mean? That means we take the flashlight of the word of God and we shine it on things that are questionable that we can't see and we illuminate it. And if it stands the test of the word of God, then it's good. If not, then it needs to be reproved. It needs to be called out. Verse number nine, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And that's what we're doing tonight. We are proving whether or not her teaching, her interpretation is acceptable to God. And I'm telling you right now, and you already know, and I challenge anybody out there to prove me wrong. Her teachings are demonic is what they are. They are demonic. Look at verse number 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Jump ahead to verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And I've talked about this before. This is where I get that saying, you know, we ought to be more concerned with doing what is wise versus what is doing right. But we need to talk about that again some other time. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You see, these days are evil. There is an agenda out there to undermine the word of God, to alienate people from serving God. And it comes from the devil and his man is going to be put on the scene. And we need to be wise to these things. Verse 17, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Well, the basic will of the Lord is that people would hear the word of God, believe and be saved forever. Right. Verse number 18, be not drunk with wine, whereas in, uh, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse number 20, we're getting real close. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Semicolon. Stop right there. Any mention of the husband and wife relationship as of yet? No. Semicolon. So verse 21 is a continuation of verse number 20. What does it say? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There is no way you can stop right here and say, okay, well, that actually means that husband and wife are equal and they can both be the head of the house. They can both preach. They can both do all of this stuff inside of the church. That is not what it's talking about at all. Again, do you see the importance of why we read everything that we did? Look at verse 20 again, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord or in the fear of God. Okay. So you say, great. What does that mean? What in the world does that mean? We'll turn to Philippians chapter two, because that is a very important verse for us to understand as a church. This is teaching the doctrine of the mind of Christ. That is what this verse is referencing. You know, in most Bibles, when uh, probably in your Bible, uh, Ephesians five after 21, there might be like a little space and then a new header. It's because there's a new thought after that. And what he's going to do is he's going to compare marriage to how Christ, uh, how Christ's relationship is uh, with us as far as operation of the church. Okay. But let me back up for a second, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You see these new evangelicals read that and say, like, Oh, see, well, there you go. They don't ever want to talk about that. That means they're both equal. No, that's not what he's talking about at all. In fact, I'll prove it to you. Look at verse number three, Philippians chapter two, look at verse number three. It says this, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. This is teaching humility. Ephesians 5 21 is the mind of Christ. It's teaching, hey, we ought to esteem others better than ourselves. Because when we esteem ourselves better than others, guess what happens? Strives, fightings, all sorts of problems. Look at verse number four. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This is how a New Testament church should operate. Verse five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Turn to first Peter five and I'll prove it to you even further. So you see that verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another Philippians two, three, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. It's the same verse. It's the same doctrine. It's the same teaching. First Peter chapter five, look at verse number one. So this is Peter here giving you some authority. He says this, the elders, which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look what he says next, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So what is Peter saying? Hey, if you want to be an elder, you want to be a pastor, you want to be a leader of a church, you know, I'm not supposed to lord over you. 
right? I preach the word of God and it's up to you whether or not you want to follow it. If you do, amen, praise God. If you don't, then you know what? Come on, you know, let's just serve God, okay? We're not all going to agree on everything. I don't lord over you as in go to your house and say, hey, huh? What is your wife lording over you? Well, what's going on here? And start auditing, you know, what's going on in here? Are you watching bad stuff on TV? Are you listening to the wrong songs? I don't have time for that. We've talked about this a million times. Look at verse number three. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So it's example leadership, which is what Peter is saying here. Verse number four. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Look at verse five. So again, what is he talking about? eternal rewards, which the new evangelicals are trying to rob their people of. Look at verse five. Likewise, ye younger, uh-oh, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resisteth the proud and give grace unto the humble. Verse six, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It's this, look, go back to Ephesians chapter five. It's the same thing. Verse 21 is the same thing is Ephesians two, three. It's the same thing as first Peter chapter five, verse five. We are supposed to be subject one to another. I'm not supposed to Lord over you. You're not supposed to put me on some kind of a pedestal here and worship me. Okay. I'm not a celebrity. I just happened to meet the qualifications in first Timothy chapter three and God let it be that I would come here and serve as a pastor. I'm human. I make mistakes. But you know what? I'm subject unto you. I, how do I do that? Well, I do that by, you know, preparing these messages and trying to make sure the church runs okay and, and great and make sure that we have a vision to reach people out in the community and all the stuff that I do. That's my job. That's how I serve you. I am here for you. Well, how are you here? You're here for the Lord. You're here for him. You're not here for me. You're here for Jesus Christ and what his Bible says, what his word says. Right? So verse 21, I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> There's no debating it. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So now you know what that's talking about. That is a reference to the doctrine of the mind of Christ, which we preach, we teach, we believe, we implement. And that does spill over into the marriage relationship. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. Now, stop right there. This church is subject unto Christ. Is Christ subject unto the church? No, to say that is blasphemy. But yet these people have no problem saying, hey, well, the wife is subject to the husband, but the husband's subject to the wife. Where's that verse? Where is it? Some of you look like you never come back. It's fine. Look at verse 26. <laughs> it says that he might sanctify. I'm sorry. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So how do we apply the mind of Christ, the doctrine of the mind of Christ in a marriage relationship? Well, it's right here. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Look, God has given us great autonomy. He's given us a book and he doesn't come down here and hound us and, and punish me for every little thing that I do wrong, does he? No, he loves us. He's abundantly merciful to us. That's how a husband is supposed to be to his wife. So verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That is why we preach the Bible in church is to wash ourselves with his teachings, his doctrines, not man-made doctrines. Now leave your place there and go to first Peter chapter three. We are wrapping up here. I am almost done. Just got a couple more passages I want to look at and we will be done. First Peter chapter number three, first Peter chapter number three, just to kind of show you an example of, of what this looks like here. First Peter chapter three, look at verse number five. Peter says this, he says, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Show me the chapter, show me the verse, show me the place in the Bible where the husband is subject unto the wife, please. Please, maybe fall <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's an inside joke if you've really studied the Bible. Verse six, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, Lord just means having power or authority or influence over. That's what it's saying. You know, it's not saying that Abraham was the Lord and Savior God over Sarah, okay? She just basically acknowledged that he was the head of the house. That's what that means. I, I should have brought this here, but Jessica actually made me a, a real solidified Lord. There's this deal where you can buy like a small piece of land and is it Scotland? 
she's not going to say nothing because then, you know, Ephesians 5 and all that, 1 Corinthians 14. Was, but anyways, she bought me this little piece of land in Scotland to, like, save the forest. And, and if you do that, they'll send you, like, this literal certificate that makes you a lord. And so I'm Lord Joseph Jones, but anyways, whatever. <laughs> I, I, I should have brought that, but I didn't. Anyways, that's all it's talking about there. That Abr you know, there... Peter's like, hey, even in the Old Testament, they understood this. The husband's the head of the wife, right? But they're both commanded to love each other respectively in their roles. Look at verse 7. Look at this. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. Notice it says weaker, meaning we're weak too. <laughs> meaning the husband is weak, Christ isn't, right? But unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So look, husbands and wives need to understand something here, right? There is a hierarchy. There is an order that God has established, but it's a wonderful thing. It is not misogynistic. It is a covering. The husband being over the wife is protection that God has established. It is a wonderful, glorious thing. But look at, look at what it says here, right? It says, and as being heirs together. So yes, husband and wife, understand we're both saved. We're both going to you know, inherit eternal life. Understand that. Operate that way. But there's a command for the husband here, isn't there? And it is to what? Dwell with them according to knowledge. Meaning you need to constantly be learning about your wife, what makes her happy, what she likes to do, different things like that, and to please her and don't email and say, well, what if she wants to be a pastor? You should honor that. Get a life, okay? Learn to read the Bible the way it's written. Dwell with them according to knowledge as unto the weaker vessel and being heirs together the grace of life. Now, don't miss the end of that verse there. What does it say? That your prayers be not hindered. Look, if you're a husband and you're jacked up and you're being that Hitler-style person to your wife, your prayers are hindered. You can, oh, Lord, save me. I lost my job. I lost this. I lost that. I lost that. God's going to be like, nope, I ain't listening to you until you get that right. You say, well, I don't like that. It doesn't matter. That's the Bible. That is what it says. Now, I, that is the last place I'm going to have you turn. I do have one picture for you. I've got one thing that I want to talk about real quick. And that is all of this can be boiled down to Beth, Allison Barr, Beth Moore, all these women preachers, all these men, soy boy preachers that want to take their side for whatever reason. Okay. It is for this reason. It is to ruin the connection. It is to ruin the connection that God's people can have with God and serving him. Let me just show you what this looks like here. All right, I gotta, um, I gotta get my props out. All right, so look, I'm gonna talk about something here. All right, this is a male fitting. I'm not being grubbed. This is what it is. Okay, this is a vacuum. This is male. This has a certain function. It's to suck up dirt. Okay, this is an attachment to scrub and get you know the dirt out of these chairs, all that stuff. Right. So here's what the new evangelicals do. They say, well. I, so this is, pretend this is the woman, I think I'm equal to this. And we can do the same thing. We can both be the head of the house. We can both be the breadwinner. We can both be the preacher. We can both be whatever we want because we said so. Okay, so what happens when that is taught? Now you have two of the same thing. It don't work. That's queer is what that is. Say, I don't like that. Well, that's what it is. That is strange. That is, <laughs> that, you might as well be a sodomite, which is kind of funny. They all support the queers anyways, don't they? Okay. So how do we make this work? Well, wrong one. This is for the steamer. You got to bear with me. All right? I got these props here. All right. This is how it's supposed to work. Okay. Now it is one tool that can actually do work. So the husband now, when I take this, and we're going to do this here. We're going to show you this. So the husband, so his prayers aren't hindered. He's going to get plugged in to the word of God, the source of power, the Bible, right? And now that the wife is using her role properly, the husband's using his role properly. Now, look, now we can operate and clean and do real work that has an everlasting impact. Hopefully that made sense. I don't know why these people can't figure this out. Man, this bothers me. So the bare bones teaching of this is queer. It's to ruin the connection. It's to alienate God's people from the truth. So they want to sit here and say, oh, you're abusing women. No, you're abusing women. And you know, I bet you none of them have the guts to confront me on this. 
Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, again, for your clear, honest truth, Lord. Thank you for a church full of people that actually believe your word as it is written. Please help us to remember these things, Lord, and to fight for the people that are trapped in this detriment teaching out there, Lord. I pray that you would use us mightily to bring this stuff down, Lord, and that we might rescue women so they can serve you in the way that you've called them to. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.